Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Dorothy Delay Masterclass Series. It's a great privilege and honor to have remarkable musician Pinchas Zuckerman joining us today. So let's welcome Master Zuckerman. You can unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. We can see you well. I love your accent. <laughs> I work on this, you know, for almost 50 years on that accent. It's no, a no, little bit, little bit less. I, I didn't learn English when I was a child. <laughs> Maybe last 30 years I've been working on it. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, nice <laughs> to be here. Nice to be with you all. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining. So we have two students performing for you today. Great. And first one is, is uh, Olga Kasovich. She's originally from Russia. She's already played a couple of times on these webinars for previous guest artists. She's, uh, uh, she's auditioning for uh, her doctoral degree uh, at Michigan State University. So hopefully she will be here next year. And I'm going to welcome Olga. And she's going to play Vinyavsky, Faust Fantasy for you. So Olga, whenever you have a chance, yes. Hello. 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 It's Hello. really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Looking forward. I wanted to introduce my uh, piano player. This is Dr. Neviaki Sigira, and he's going to accompany me today. That is very nice what you just did. You've just, you've just done 100 points for me. <laughs> I'm serious. And when next time you don't see somebody introduce their pianist, say something, please, because that's so <laughs> disrespectful to the piano. <laughs> to the pianist because most of the repertoire we play piano violin it's not violin and piano okay so please that's a very beautiful thing you just did i i congratulate you <laughs> thank you so much Wait one second. 
let me just one or two things. When you play this piece, um, I would suggest that you tune your, I tune anyway with harmonics. I learned that from cellists. Um, because what you want is to have the bottom harmonic be a little bit higher. Uh, okay, I also, on the viola, I do that on the viola a lot, but I do it on the fiddle all the time. So, now when you start this piece, you can judge it. See, it's already flat. If you tune it a little bit higher, because then, that'll be closer to the E major. Do you understand? You play the G sharp. Yes. Yeah, the G sharp is always flat. And when you start, when you start the piece, you have to be so convinced inside of you, not show off, I don't mean that, but to be convinced that that's the most important note the listener will ever hear. Mm -hmm. no? Forget passages, forget the, all the hysterionics and the circus, that's nothing. Everybody's waiting for that, of course. But what you want is to get their attention on the E natural. So my suggestion is that you start, you look at it, you look at the E natural when you start, meaning the E, and start to vibrate just a tiny bit before you start. You play everything with a third finger. Maybe you should start thinking about playing with the fourth finger as well, because as Heifetz said, you don't use your fourth finger to fall off. <laughs> so, but it's important how you use that, because if you... You, you want to support a little bit with the third finger, not just, but, but also here. It's wonderful. When you start using that fourth finger, you're adding a variety of sounds. Try once with the third finger as you did. Look at the bow. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. That's a little late. The sound is a little late. Paw. Yeah, but start to vibrate before you play the note. Vibrate before uh -huh. you play the note. Okay, good. Now do the same thing with the fourth finger. Exactly that sound. Again, 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 again. Okay, what will help you, you're a little bit in this angle. If you come up a little bit, as you come up, the bow, it also makes us look at you, you see? True, yeah. That's much. Okay, you can play with your fourth finger, so please don't stop using your fourth finger. Please, it's such a mistake. Most people, oh, I don't, nonsense. Okay, so, and now when you go up, come from about here, which is, let's say, 12 o'clock, come to uh -huh. 1 o'clock. It will make your bow much stronger. Mm -hmm. Up, up, up. You want to always start. The concept is to start with the head of the violin approximately where your nose is. Okay, not mm -hmm. below, not above but somewhere in this neighborhood. Sure. Mm -hmm. You see what happened? That's good. See what happened? Your bow went a lot slower. You're now in yeah. control. Now you're in control of your bow. So make that the most beautiful note you've ever played in your life. Come on, once more. Maria Callas, Maria Callas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Same speed down bow, not faster. Clean, clean, clean. Don't do the Lushmanerai. 
Yeah. Stop the bow a little bit. Stop the bow before you shift. Again, again, again. Just look. Turn a little bit. Turn, turn, turn a little bit. Okay. Fourth finger. For every time you play fourth finger, Dima will give you, give you ten cents. Slow, slow, slow. Slow, slow. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Now play the same thing with the piano. One, just one bar before. Play one bar before, please, Mr. Pianist. That's flat. That's flat. That's mm. flat. Put your E up a little bit. Man, put your E up. Yeah. That's right. That's not a trick. That's just the way it is. Because as you go up, the harmony harmonics get smaller. So it gets flat, you see. It doesn't go higher. Mm. You have to support. The way we support is bringing the, the simple. Okay. Okay, you have a little bit of a the notion to go back with your head a little bit too uh -huh. much a little bit too much because it makes the violin much longer you want to be a little bit more you might want to experiment and not for today just ideas with a different chin rest that will give you more freedom to go this way you're a little bit here see mm -hmm. yeah a little yeah, yes still a little bit yeah you need to just Go somewhere, there's a violin shop, and you know, and just, just take three or four and try them. What you might want to do, let me see that chin rest a little closer. Yeah, you might want to come a little bit further, further here. You see, yeah, I was thinking that. <laughs> see, you women can do that because you have, um. Um, you, your apple is different than ours. I cannot hold that. It chokes me. <laughs> but women can, can go a little more. So you should try to do that. The other thing is, if you go against the piano with the mid, your midsection, you go lean against the piano and bend your knees just a little bit. So you are going, you're going this way, not with your head, but with your body. You, what you want is to open this angle here you want to make uh -huh. this angle as big as possible with comfort uh -huh. not something that's uncomfortable because right now your bow is a little bit off because you are hanging backwards you want to go forward okay uh -huh. you can do that you can also go to the corner of a of a room and just lean on this side the right side you so you're playing right into the corner so the, that wall and that you'll see the how much forward you're going because what you want is you want your violin to be up a little bit i don't know what you're using here are you using something down here yeah yeah i'm using the oh, shoulder rest yeah that's the worst one that's the coon that's, that's the worst one. <laughs> i hate that the coon comes from ottawa that's the one of the things in ottawa that's really bad okay I made a terrible mistake once I said it to a student in the class, and Mrs. Kuhn was there. Whew, did I get over the head? She said, Rrr. okay, 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 lady, sorry, you know, but that's not good. What you want is something that's flat and light, which is the Korean one. The latest Korean, about 10 years ago, maybe now, it's a very easy one, it's very light, and it gives you more support, because what you want here is support, and that has this 
<laughs> angle just when you need the support. You know, mm. it, it means, it goes like this. That's one of the problems. So you have to start looking at a chin rest, use another, just use it. Just start doing something different, okay? And if I was there, if I was there with you physically, I would show you how you can play without anything except a little schmata down here. Uh, that, oh. Yeah, 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 because it's so easy. But I can't do it this way. I have to be there. It'll take you about five minutes, I promise you, if I was there. But one of these days, I, I'll see you, and we'll work on that, because it's so easy. It really is so easy. Many, many people have done it. Most important thing, once you get it right, mm -hmm. you have to give yourself a couple of days to get used to it. It's like a new pillow, okay? okay? But you can play beautifully yeah. without that. You just have to start doing now. Think of the sound coming from the right hand, okay? Yeah. Do it one more time now. And sing, sing, sing. Play, play as though you're singing this aria. Okay, when you get to the same passage on the D string, ta -da -dee -da -dee -da -dee, a little more baritone. -da -dee -da 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 -dee. Don't worry about Vinyatsky, he's not coming. -da -dee -da 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 -dee -da -da. You want to do a little Popolsky crying, you know? Not Russian. In Russia, we go, it's the opposite. <laughs> okay? I'm joking. Okay, so a little more, a little darker on the bottom. Okay, go on now, go on now. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. You have three notes. You play the same. You want some movement, either up or down. No, don't play, eh, uh, eh, uh, eh, uh, okay? Once more. Sing, sing, sing. Slow-bo, slow-bo, S-L-O-W, slow-bo. Once more, yeah? It's a little sharp. Popolsky crying. Okay. It's the same like in a Polonaise, you know? Same thing. Same composer. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. So do it again. And a little more detaché. Go ahead. Catch from the string. Catch. You understand? Catch. Yeah. 
But do you don't do that. When you do that, oh, this guy, you go very good. The other way. Inside the instrument. Two slides, not down and up. You can't <laughs> down uh, is good. Again, F natural. F natural is a little high, a little too high. Very good, very good. It's really very, you play beautifully. But I have to add a few things, okay? Just so yes. you start to think about. It. When you start this second episode, the introduction is one thing, right? You have the introduction. Yes. We want to now have, um, we want to have a theme. So the theme starts rather beautifully. I think you need to make a little more, it's intimate sound, but with reflection. You don't just play intimate. You're playing very beautifully, but you need to be a little bit more convinced about this, your own sound. Then therefore the music becomes much stronger. Because yeah. don't forget, Spohr and Sarasate and Vinyavsky and Izai and all these great masters, they wrote for themselves. 
So mm -hmm. they already had probably a different feeling for that when that theme starts, because that's the way they played. I'm sure. We don't have affidavit, yeah. but I'm pretty sure that when they wrote it, they wrote it for themselves. Therefore, they wanted to make it the most beautiful they could do it. Okay. So when you start that, it's a statement. It's a statement, musical statement within an incredible context of what the violin can do. The violin can do so many wonderful things if we just let it happen. But in order for it to do that, we have to analyze pretty much everything we do, not all the time, but as concept. I'm talking about the concept of how you play the music, how you play the violin. It goes together. It, it cannot be separated. And if it's separated, no, govno. Okay? Shh, I didn't say that. So you have to find your singing voice. Tell me a story. When you start this melody, tell, after you start, tell me a story. Start again from there, okay? I just want to hear you tell me a story, okay? Okay. I love you so much. Come on, do it, do it, do it. You can't do it in Bach. Do it here. Okay, you know, they'll pay you more money. <laughs> Do it again. I'm joking. <laughs> joking. Okay, once more. Cry a little bit. No, 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 no. Yeah, like a great singer. Yeah. Once more. Once more. Once more. Once more. Comfortable, comfortable going down, yes. W slow ball once more sing You know, one of the great things about people like Milstein, he used the fingerboard going from one, uh, one position to the other position as though he was speaking, as though he was singing the words. So it wasn't going from one position to the other. He was going from yeah. one position to the other with a voice, with a consonant or sometimes a vowel. Because otherwise we play the fiddle. Okay, that, that, yes. that, great master. He was a great master in telling the story. Then when you tell, then you can tell the story. You can do it a little bit more, a little bit less. You can do this, they can do that. That's up to you. But before when you just played, you just played pretty much the notes. Very nice, very beautiful, but you could add so much more in what you have, okay? Now, some of that yeah. has to be done with the bow, with the bow. The bow creates the color, not the left hand. Left hand is when you're making, let's say, something to eat, uh, and all of a sudden you taste it and you go, mm, needs a little salt. Okay, so you put a little salt. <laughs> but 
but all the fruit, all the vegetables are here, you see. And yeah. it, that's very important because the bowl is 85%. And if anybody tells you different, tell them, I said so. Okay, blame me. The 85% of what we do comes from the right hand. Okay? Many years ago, I had a fabulous student uh, that just did not want to comprehend that for the longest time. I finally thought to myself, what can I do to make him open up, you know? So I said, hey, the right hand is like your bank account. He said, what? I said, bank account. Why bank account? I said, because if it sounds good, you make more money. You know what? Overnight, bingo, the light went on. <laughs> it was amazing, okay? Now you can tow sounding point, you can do all kinds of the stuff we work on, which you should, which you should. And it's different, uh, what is different in the arm application is when you go from here to here. So when you do... shift the weight you shift the weight okay it's what galamian always just said a doorknob doorknob okay that's so simple but to do it is, is not easy so you just need to do slow so do you see when i go from here different position both here and here See Yasha, you know JH, Yasha Heifetz, the yeah, yeah, yeah. just a little bit, not much, yeah. just a little bit, but uh -huh. it was so, was so perfect because he practiced for hours, you know, perfect, yeah. perfect. Okay, that you should do that G minor last movement slowly. You could also do it then in rhythm. You're a little bit too high. Yeah. What you want to do is your thumb is inside, right? Right, the frog. I don't know if you yeah. can see that. In the frog. And then oh, yeah. this one, this finger, the middle finger, we used to say, I'm sure Miss Delay said the same thing. It, hello, they're the first neighbors. They like each other. They go, hello, how are you? Nice to see you. How, how's your day today? Yeah, it's okay. Then comes the next neighbor. And the next neighbor goes, hey, I'm a boss here because when you tell me so to do something, I go like that. And then I go back up again. And then comes the third finger for releasing the first finger. So you have this motion. This finger stays basically here. That's why we have a square here. So it goes right on top. It's so simple. The minute yeah. we start to play, we tend to go up. Be careful. Be careful. You don't want to go too far up. A little bit, okay, but then come right back again. This will help you. <laughs> Fix it. Okay? I'm sure Dima will help you when you go, when you're next year. Just a little bit, and then backwards. And you do detaché, those two rhythms, each one five times. It's that simple. Yeah. Just the... Uh, Comp all separate, all separate. You get to the bottom, you go back again five times. That'll be about maybe eight minutes. And then you stop. Mm -hmm. Then stop and say, what did I do? How can I improve it? Okay? What does it feel like? I tell you, within two, two three days, you're going to feel so much better because it's yes. going to sound amazing. Okay? Because yes. everything we do comes from here. That's it. There's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> I wish we could, but we can't. And then you start with the scales. You start with Galamian scale book. And you, do, you start with two, you go to four, six, eight, put it 60 to the quarter. It goes 
the same 60, this goes faster, this stays the same. You understand? That Galamian book is yes. perfect. You do those scales, maybe six or seven of them every day, major, minor, up and down, 15 minutes. And then do Bach for maybe 20 minutes, 15 minutes, stop. And then play your piece and see what happens. See what happens. When you play this phrase, th start singing to yourself. No, I don't mean singing when you play. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll find how much room you have, how much timing, more timing here. Because we get stuck with these four strings, you know? <clears throat> Why? It's nothing to do with four strings. Yeah. So the more you do that, the more your concept starts thinking of consonants, vowels, harmony, speed of bow, position of the fingers, it will make the music. It will make your music because you play really very well. And you just need some fundamental, give or take, six to eight months of fundamental work. And I'm sure Dimitri will show you that because he did that. We all did it. And it makes a big difference. And the only thing I want to share with you today is don't ever leave it alone. Once you have it in your bloodstream, don't leave it alone. And you know why? Because this brain is the slowest brain there is. There's the slowest computer. So we have to remind it every day. That's what I've been doing. I do it every day. I have a routine. I go in my studio here and I start my scales. And that's it. And then I, I do scales in the pieces depending on what I'm playing. Beethoven concerto is perfect for that. Okay, when you play octaves, for example, in the Stravinsky, play the bottom note. The yeah. bottom note as much as you can. Okay, not to avoid it, but if you go, it'll be out of tune. You understand? Yes. When we had Soviet Union, people would come to competition, you know, every one of them, and they played. Americans would come back and say, Pinky, you know what? That guy from Russia, my guy, he played so in tune, those actors. I said, you idiot, he only played the bottom note. <laughs> they said, oh my God, it's true, but it's okay. It's okay, you can do that. You win first prize, you play in tune, you know? But then you have to play in tune the rest of your life. That's not so easy. <laughs> okay, you find your way of doing it. But the yeah. bottom note is very important. When you play chamber music, you play, let's say, with the viola, you play with the cello, let them be predominant. Let them play louder than what you play in the octave passages, okay? If so play me again the phrase, the first phrase. I want to hear that first phrase from the stomach. Play from your stomach, okay? Mm. No, no, no. Yeah. Like an old man. It's like Barishnikov. We go, we don't do. There was another fellow. He played the cello. He was a wonderful cellist. His name was Kazals. And he told me once to play the phrases like with rainbows. 
rainbow, he would say. And I thought, my God, what the hell are you talking about? Rainbow. Because there's no end in the horizon. Yeah. It continues, right? That's what he yes. meant. But he also meant the colors inside the rainbow. I never forgotten that, you know? Never. That is so beautiful and so simple. And he talked about nature, nature. Okay. And he would tell you again and again and again and again until he finally said, now you know how to play. <laughs> you know, it was amazing. So when you see great players, they do that. Great fiddle players do that automatically. I mean, somebody must have told them, obviously. The other thing I want to share with you is there was a fellow called Kogan, Leonid Kogan. I spent 1968, it was a long time ago, with Isaac Stern and his, his son and wife, of course. They were all, we were all together in the south of France. And one day he came and he said to Isaac, of course, in Russian, he said, I'll show you something. And he started. even slower than that. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. He had the most phenomenal control. So Isaac said to him, why did you do that? He said, what else do I do in the Soviet Union? There was an answer. It's not bad, you know? In other words, you idiot, because it makes you, it gives you tremendous control. Oh, he was unbelievable, unbelievable control. So was Oystra also the same, similar, but with a Yankalevich touch, you know? It was a little different, but my God, he could do it. So once in a while, you might want to put that metronome. And if you can get to about 10 of them on a down bow with a crescendo, go back now, 10 yeah. with diminuendo. And you'll see how fast those 10 go. It's amazing, okay? Mm -hmm. Do that, yes. do that, for control, for control. People ask me sometimes, what do you do if you get nervous? First of all, I say, you don't get nervous. What's this nervous? The heart goes a little faster, of course, thank God. If we didn't have that, how in the hell could you play the music, you know? So, but then you have to control, you have to control those emotions, okay? Mm -hmm. What you're doing is controlling the emotion, but you're losing content. Okay, you just so when you know more, you know the easier it's gonna get, and then you'll have the choices of what, how, and what you want to do. Those slides, of course, I don't do that voice slides in classical music except when I really want to, <laughs> and sometimes I do it because I feel like it, but it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. I just do it because you play the violin for so many years. I mean, I've been playing the violin for 56 years, you know, uh, it's time to do something new sometimes. <laughs> okay, so don't think that it's just one direction, but you need to think of half a dozen different things that yes. will give you freedom, real freedom to express yourself, because you play so well. Intonation. That's another thing Casals talked about. Intonation. When you play sharps, play minor very important so when you have sharps in major is one then when you have minor the sharps are a little different but then you have bemol then you have e flat for your b flat for and when you practice in those scales you need to exaggerate that intonation so it becomes part of your being, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you're playing something like not that's bad. 
just a tiny bit. Look how it sounds. When it's minor, not. Okay? So, again, it comes from the scales. That will help you when you play this. play it like that. It's so internalized. But that's what gives you the expression. Because in music like this, we need to express the rhythm is very important. The meter and the rhythm above it, plus intonation. Those two things are absolutely of the utmost importance. And if you don't do that, the, then the music is loses a whole aspect of charm, uh, virtuosity, etc. Eh, it's just the notes. Okay, in every one of those pieces, from Vinyevsky to Spohr, to Vioton, to all Isai, all those pieces, all those pieces. That's very important. I think youngsters don't listen today to intonation because we have digitalized sound. And the digitalized sound, no good. It's no good. You have to listen to it, but then leave it alone and do what you need to do to make the violin speak better. And therefore... Yeah you will feel so much better about it. And when you feel good, it's going to sound good. And when it sounds good, you're going to feel good. And then, you know what? You're also going to look good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I add that a little bit. Mr. Galami never said that. But I said it to, to girls. I said, and you're going to look better. And much be you're going to feel really good. Then you're going to look good. You know? And they do. They, they never forget that, you know. They always remind me years later. Do you know what you said to me? I said, yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> so, and that's it. Because you, you have wonderful ability. You have great intonation already. But you need to e examine that a little bit more in your mm -hmm. development as a musician. Um, yes. Okay? All right. Yes. Very good. Nice to hear Bye. you. Hope to see you one day in without machines. <laughs> Is that machines? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Olga. Well, it was incredible. It was incredible almost an hour. It was felt, it felt like five minutes. I didn't want to interrupt because you answer most of the questions uh, I wanted to ask you already. I'm sure I will, I will yeah, ask I you something you else know. because, you know, you, you such okay. a... Okay, <laughs> I don't mind repeating. I don't mind repeating. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, Perhaps maybe you can uh, spend a little bit more time after a uh, 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 second performer will finish and we'll talk a little bit more. But we can uh, go, if you want to, I'm happy to go after, you know, the, when it's over, officially when it's over. I'm happy to go in, you know, the next 15, 20 minutes, whatever. I thank don't... you. Thank you. Very generous of you. So we'll get ready for our second performer. Her name is Yon Miao Li. She's a first year DMA student here at Michigan State. And she's going to play... Uh, with her pianist, uh, Mingu Yao, they're going to do first moment of Chrysler Sonata. This uh, two. Then one. It's easier. Sounds better also. Once more. Okay. You know, it's one chord. It's not. It's one chord. It's like. It's not so okay one chord one note
Okay, after the forte, don't play too soft. You play soft, it sounds like you are scared of it. Okay, the voice starts to go, <laughs> so. Play it, play it, play it, play it, play it. Once more. Your, your vibrato, your vibrato should get slower when you make the minuendo. Now, you do when you make the minuendo. It's the other way. Don't make it obvious, not. He didn't write anything there. The harmony itself will make it more intense. Okay? Once more. Think a little bit inside. Bum, bum, bim, bum, 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 bum. In eighth notes. It will help you with the rhythm. Very important, before you stop, bam, then you go away, not before. After the piano plays, okay? So it looks like you're leading the pianist. Just leave it the bow there. Okay, now, Mr. Pianist, could you please play your right pedal. Before she starts, put the right pedal down, and when she changes the note after the chord, pick it up, like what you do when you play. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so after, after the second chord. That's right, so, <laughs> off. Just so a little, we have a little bit of help from the piano, okay? Do that, when, okay. Put the pedal down when she starts. Before she starts, put the pedal down. Okay. Boom. More, more, more. No, no. Different color. More bow, more bow. Vibrate, vibrate. It's not vibrating. Vibrate. Did 
Here you go again. Vibrate every note. Bayam, body major, tari minor dio. Okay, once more. Vibrating on the E natural. Pa ba 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 ba. Come on. Good. G major chord. G major chord. Lift your bow a little bit. elbow in the sound. Do that. And as you get comfortable, you will have more less space between the two notes. Uh, now it's okay, do that again. a little bit. Once more. Is it better? You like that better? Yeah. Well, do that again. It's like question number seven. Remember? We have to use the elbow. Up and down, up and down. Tessituras, tess I call fingerings, tessituras. You go. Start softer. And as you make a crescendo, broaden the stroke. Otherwise, you don't have a crescendo. I know it has that. But the dots get longer <laughs> when you make the crescendo. Depends how much, of course. So, and don't play on this string. The piano can't do that. Okay? So, start again. For the piano. the piano on the F, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, do it.
Okay, not bad, not bad. Your temporal relation, you have to think of temporal relation. Uh, the first temporal relation is between the adagio, the beginning, to the presto. If you play it's half twice as fast you're doing right now you're doing three and a half too fast so but if you want daddy then play that's very important you have to figure this out it doesn't happen by playing the violin it happens by thinking and looking at the notes because you don't want to play the meter in the fast tempo too fast because then the adagio becomes much faster you don't want that to be too fast you want those introductions are very important in tempo relations. It's not absolutely exact, but very close. Nobody can do it exact. It's impossible. But if you play fast introduction, then the Allegro will be even faster. It has to be. So, and it comes from Mr. Haydn. Haydn started all that. Introductions, if you look at all his symphonies, a hundred, he wrote 116 symphonies, you know? Imagine that. Oh, no, sorry, 104. Sorry, sorry. 104 symphonies, 116 quartets. That's 200 pieces. <laughs> and Mr. Beethoven probably thought, my God, how did he do that? So what he did is look at the introductions and then the allegros, and it's amazing how they fit because everything in music has to have the golden rule. If it doesn't have the golden rule, it will fall over. And the golden rules come from architecture, comes from a very clear line, two thirds and one third. All those, all those places in Beijing, those high rise, they'll take a look, two thirds and one third. They go thinner as they go up to the top. And we still, I'm amazed how they did the Empire State Building, you know? It's amazing. But because, don't forget, there's also a lot of wind. The Empire State Building goes 12 feet one way and 12 feet the other way. We don't feel that because the, of the Earth rotation. But that's what the architects, they had to deal with that. The same thing with the composite compositions. They have to deal with that architecture. So you have to find your color, your meter, your color, your bow ability, okay? And it comes back again to what you want to do and how you want to do it. You can't just play Kreutzer. It doesn't mean anything. It's basically an exercise. You know, it's a nice exercise. <laughs> I'm joking. But it's not the most dramatic piece that he wrote. It's not. It is maybe a little difficult because if you don't think of these things, it becomes more and more problematic. Okay, so think about how you relate the tempo first and foremost. Okay, that's very important. Please, that's very important. And when you start the allegro, not too loud. And then when he writes C R E S C, he writes crescendo. That's usually the first bar of the crescendo is the lowest point in the phrase. Now. Two. See, the retard is inside the note. One. And if you play too fast, it loses the metric strength that this movement should have. Okay? Um, so when you play secondary subject, the little introduction to the next subject, um, you play twice as fat, twice as slow. That's not because automatically you're going to play twice as slow because it's too fast. <laughs> Do you understand? Okay, so find your meter and find the pulse with a metronome and play with a metronome. This movement becomes much, much easier to.
to absorb when you have that metric hmm, pulse. And I had mentors that would come in front of me and they would bang my arms, bang my neck at the back, you know, pow, pow, pow. No, today we don't do that anymore. You know, hey, you know what? It feels pretty good today. <laughs> okay, so start again. And make the crescendo all the way to the E natural, to the C major chord. Once more. Use your bow. No, for the piano. It's not, who are you? No. Get off. And Mr. Pianist, you play too fast. Put a little more pressure on your fingers. No play Mozart. Yeah. Go ahead. From the piano. From the piano. the bottom note off there's no there's no pedal there right play the pedal the last one play the arpeggio separate separate get off the top note a little sooner Same dynamic. Same dynamic. Do me a favor. Play once the bottom note with the right hand. <laughs> See, you need a little time. Take a little time. Once more. I didn't hear what he said. I need an emphasis. I don't know about time, but I need emphasis. C major. Sfotando, right? Yes. Okay. Sfotando, this is the only composer that I do. Sfotando, I make like accent, but sostenuto. Dun, dun, dun. Otherwise, it's forte piano. Well, you understand? The only composer, when you play sfotando, you play, you, you sustain the bow. Not. You understand? Every, only this, this music, only in this, every piece. Sforzando means sforzando tenuto, not sforzando go away, because then it's a forte piano. Capito? And you start this a little bit softer.
three beats. One, two, 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 two. Diminuendo, no retardando. You played. Keep it going. Architecture, architecture, architecture. Play here. on the second beat. You know, Mr. Beethoven created a revolution. You understand me? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about Chinese revolution. I'm talking about musical revolution. Okay? He made a revolution. Nobody before wrote like that. You know? Oh my God. Vienna, we still suffer because of him. Okay? But what's interesting couple of things I just want to tell you. Uh, because you can play this piece. It's just how. All right. When Mozart wrote his C minor concerto, piano concerto, he wrote... Uh, oh, I don't know. I forget how it goes now. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So... Amazing. That was already way ahead of his time. Okay? Mr. Salzburg. Now comes Mr. Beethoven. And he looked at that piece and he said, Oh my God. How do I write a piece for piano and orchestra in C minor? So guess what he did? With all the revolutions and everything he created before and after, he wrote... That's a complete statement because I am sure that he looked at that C minor concerto and he said, I can't write like that. I'm going to do what I know how to do, which was pretty good, of course. But think about it. Think about 25 years earlier. Again. Again. He took Bach, he took Bach, because Bach was the first one to give us a chromatic scale. Right? He added a whole bunch of notes. Before it was... Over there. Okay, so Mozart took that, and he went one step beyond that. He went up, and he went down with chromaticism. Now, that's unique. You have to remember that, please. Remember, look it up. Look up chromaticism. Look up Bach's inventions. Look at what Mozart wrote right after that and what Beethoven did as Mozart was still alive. Those guys were not stupid, you know. They were very smart. And they looked at each other's music. And so there's a relationship. I'm trying to tell you, there has to be a musical has to be a variety of things, of course, because of their own DNA, but there is a, a connection in music. If you didn't have this connection, it doesn't mean anything, nothing. And that's very important to remember. And sometimes they will copy themselves much later in life, much later in life of what they did in the beginning, because they must have looked at something they said, ooh, that's not bad, I'm going to put that slightly in a different inversion. Okay, like the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, he writes already some things beforehand that have slight anticipation of what's going to happen in the Ninth Symphony. Okay? That's how we learn to play music. We learn, of course, to play the violin. If we don't play the violin, then you have nothing. You just look at the page. Okay. So you need to begin to really think of meter, intonation, color, and how those episodes fit in a movement like that, okay? So, play from there, and a big accent on the apple.
It's a pedal point. Don't make anything out of that. Let the piano play. Okay, that's pedal point. Let the piano take over there. So that was much better now when you played that. So when you're... Say four plus two. Four bars plus two bars. Okay, play again. the piano and you play with a string instrument you need to find the voicing mr pianist the voicing in your left hand and your right hand not to cover the string instrument because when you play those chords you're covering the instrument you're covering the, the violin completely you have to come down but you have to find your pressure point and voicing so the the chord is full you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Play me once, just alone, those chords. Okay. Suppose you play the middle voices stronger, top weaker, and then the bottom. Try that. The middle. Fortissimo. Take it easy. Once more. And then bam, bam, bam. Then crescendo to the end to help the violin. Okay. That's good. That's
it's not bad. Now, when you play, um, let's just practice a little bit. I'll show you a different way of playing those pizzicatos. Um, because you can't hear it. Nothing. When you play, put, it, put the, your finger on the string, D, A, and E, just like that. And Not from the top, from the note, from the string. That's better. Once more. Good. If you hold the bow like this, hold it inside like this. That's right. Now from the string. Right from the string. Yeah, and try to go right across. Not this way or this way. Across. Straight. And start, start with a little more meat. Okay? Yeah, you're still playing for me. Bring the... Yeah. That's right. That's right. So after the first movement, you will have to tune. Because the violin goes out of tune. But that is a very important... Uh, because otherwise, those pizzicati you don't hear. It's just bleh, bleh, bleh. Now, I learned that from a wonderful concert master in Philadelphia, you know? And um, he was doing a bit, the Italian symphony of, of Mendelssohn, and the first note is, and everybody goes, no. He said, from the string. Wow! It was amazing, the violins, you know? It's incredible sound. Otherwise, it's okay. Some things we do like that, of course. That's natural. But when it's like that, when the piano is going berserk with all those notes, you can't hear anything. And the other thing is, when you play this, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, you want to give a little bit more tension. into that don't shy away from that so play from here pronounce pronounce ba -dum, ba -dum. chords and it's too long bum 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 get off get off get off get off we have a bad register this we have nightmares because of this place you know <laughs> so don't play so loud when you take those chords take it easy okay go on now buddy funny
don't give yourself time to come down. Give yourself time. Pick up the bow. Just a little bit slower. You know, when you play this, pronounce on the bottom, because you only hear, you know, but the bottom you want. Do that once. Da -da 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 -ding. Let it go. Okay, you need to practice that. You need to practice that a little bit. When you have an E natural like that, it's easy to let, just release the finger, but you need to practice it slowly. And tam, pa pam, pa pam, pa pam, and pa pam, pa pam, pa pam, pa pam, to give yourself a chance to organize the hands, you know? It's very important. You already could start with A major when you play the A major scale. When you go, you can do that also. So you start feeling that it's a it's a reflex that helps a passage like that. You know, when you're playing, be nice to your pianist. <laughs> they have a thousand notes. We have about 20, okay? So be nice to them, because that's a hard piece. That's a very hard movement for them, uh, in the last movement too. So we need to really uh, try and accompany, even when you have the, the major voice, don't play so loud. Both of you, you're playing everything too loud in the forte. Up and down a little more. Um, so it becomes music. It's not just and then you play release. Don't hold it. The piano needs to hear themselves. If you play too loud there on the top, it will go oh, it's a little bit like a boat in a storm, you know? Be very careful. These are few acoustical aspects as well as musical to help each other to help each other. And don't forget, you cannot ever play as loud as the piano. Never. And that doesn't mean that you can't play loud. That's not what I mean. Because the pianist's job, the pianist's vocation should be, how do I voice what I have to help the sonority of the violin or the cello or whatever instrument one plays with? Because if you play this piece, like you play something by Liszt, it's over. You can't. You have to readjust the whole business of voicing. Voicing is everything on the piano. If you don't voice properly your hands, the inner voices, then it becomes just loud and aggressive. Uh, you don't want that. You have enough power as it is. You have 88 keys, and each one of those keys has three strings. We got four strings. That's it. You know? So... Be kind, please. Vo really start looking at how you voice, say, the beginning of the G major Brahms sonata, the first chord. How do you voice that to give the violin that 
incredible sort of voce. Okay, and it's the same thing here when you come in, when the, when the piano comes in after the first two bars of the violin, two and a half bars, that should not be a forte the way you would play in, I don't know, I guess Liszt is the only thing I can think of. But even there, listen a little bit to what Mr. Uh, Rubenstein has done his life in voicing the piano. And you know, one of the great lessons I heard from him, which I try to apply as much as I can to the violin, he always said, piano has to be like a bell. Boing, boing. It's not, the, when you look at the hammer, it goes boing, like the bell, the old bells, you know? Boing, inside, boing. It doesn't go boing, it's impossible. So you have to think of that, how your hand functions as the hand inside the bell, you know? And that's, the, all of a sudden, you will have a sonority you never had before. And it's much easier than to play for you, for us, with you. Okay? When I, if I was there, I would, I would show you. I would go behind you and hold your elbows because that's where you're coming from. You're, not play, you're playing from here. It should come from here. It's a release, like a, really like a bell. You know what I'm saying? A bell in the church? Boing, boing, boing. It's an amazing sound. And when you do that, it carries. If you go, bum, it stops. You go, bum. And Mr. Rubenstein was really one of the few pianists that really played with the release of the hand from the shoulder to the elbow to the fingers. Amazing. That's why he goes, pop, 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 pop. He didn't play the notes. He played a circle. Pop, 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 pop. Amazing. You can never miss it. He just kept drawing circles. He even said to me, he said, look, I'm doing a circle. <laughs> it was fantastic. Anyway, little things like that. Otherwise, I think you're playing very well. Put your metronome on, please. The young, pop, pop, whatever tempo you want to play, okay, put the metronome on and stay with that. Stay as much as you can when you're practicing, okay, alone. And then look at that metronome, how that is applicable to the introduction, okay? That's very important for you especially. You guys in China, you never use metronomes, okay? You just go fast, fast and loud. Because if you go fast and loud, you'll be number one. Mm, don't think so, okay? So please, uh, respect, respect the music that way and then you will be able to play much better. And don't forget to vibrate. When you, vi when you stop sometimes on the first finger in the left hand, it just stops. You're not even hearing it anymore, you know? Um, so you, you really need to, um, you need to think of those things. And the way I try to, um, what I try to do with our students is I make them play scales, the scales with each note, each finger, I'm sorry, each finger the same dynamic, the same movement. So you're really just not, just easy. Mr. Galamian always talked about the vibrato as being a knock, knocking. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hello, who are you? Vibrato, okay. Wom, 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 wom. And there's a joke about somebody asked Mr. Galamian, how many vibratos do you need? <laughs> it's a joke, right? He said, three. Why three? He said, you play wah, 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 for the fast movement. Then you play the second one for the slow movement. Wah, 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 wah. And then the third one for every day. <laughs> so, people, yeah, exactly, you're doing it already. That's good. You want that knocking. The more knocking you have, the bigger the sound will travel. If you go, that's like a singer stopping the air inside the throat. You don't want machine gun. You don't want. Not this, a certain amount. If you go too much. The pitch will go. 
but it doesn't mean faster, it just means smaller. <laughs> So one of the most amazing things is when you do that, all of a sudden you're creating colors, tremendous color. And then the bow will help that. It takes a few days, you know, to get used to it, but do it with the scales. Uh, slow vibrato, meaning the same. Okay? It'll help you with the opening, for example. Opening of this piece. It'll help you with the slow movement. Because what I usually hear is Ooh, that's bad. That's a bad habit. But you have to break that habit by just slowly practicing those scales. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, Mo. Pinkas, thanks so much. It was just amazing uh, to to absorb you, to to so talk good. about so many so many different things, and you answer already zillions of questions, which <laughs> I was uh, about to ask you. And I just read some of the questions in the chat. Maybe you could uh, just elaborate a little bit of some, on something you already talked today, and when we had discussion yesterday about your practicing routine. You mentioned about everyday playing scales. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Well, scales are numerous aspects in scales. I've, first of all, you're coming back to the same pitch uh, every day. Try to relate each day to the same pitch the previous day. Major, minor, three octaves, four octaves, doesn't matter. It's as long as the pitch is the same. And what I try to do is then begin to use the bow. I don't start with two anymore. I start with four, you know. And for the people that don't understand that that particular Galamian method, it's division of bow. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So... And always a little release. Some people call it vibrato, I call it release. Because <laughs> if you're not warmed up and you start with that vibrato, you're gonna get problems in no time. So slow down that, 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 that. Metronome, 60 to the quarter, chuck, 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 and then three, and then you get six. Again, bow division. Now you got three and three, so it's. Then four. Uh, eight, sorry. fingering partly because I like it but besides that the theory or the concept behind that is when you play uh, B flats for example you play one then four why because it cuts as he would say cuts the fingerboard in half so it Half. That makes so much sense. Doesn't mean you're going to use that. Sometimes you will, of course. But the concept is that all of a sudden the fingerboard is shorter. It's not such an uphill battle to get there. Uh, and so these things are essential, but of course the bow makes a big difference when you're doing that. And you can do that, you begin to feel it when you're playing eight. <laughs> All of 
of a sudden you have more bulk because the fingerboard is shorter. You're not worried. And then we go to the next one. So I do that. I have started in the last few years, I do sometimes just because I feel like it, I do. So that's just because that's what it is. So it's not bad to go back to flesh. I did that when I was a little boy. That's the only thing I knew. We didn't have the Galamian book yet in 56, 57, 58. You know, it was just beginning to penetrate to Europe and other places. But it needs to be very carefully done so the meter stays the same. It helps all those passages, uh, in Beethoven and Brahms and Tchaikovsky, whatever it is, you all of a sudden have an inner meter that helps, helps the bow, helps the intonation. Um, and don't get too fancy. You can play some thirds, of course, once you play thirds. Um, but not all the time, necessarily. I don't, I'm not a believer in doing double octaves and all that stuff. You know, some, some of the great masters did that. God bless them. Uh, I do what the music requires. And if I need to do double octaves in certain passages, I do it, you know, because it's there. It's not something I practiced for, you know, seven years to play, you know, five notes, da 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 Vinyavsky or something, D minor, things like that. Where I like to do the thirds is things like this. Because that's for intonation. Contact with the bow. And the minute there's one that doesn't speak, go right back to the beginning. You don't do the same again. You don't go, you know. It makes the one hour so much shorter. Because if you start doing that, the brain goes, you know, mishmash. So it's very organized. And that's one of the things we learned. It took a couple of years, but we learned how to practice properly. And so the old man would tell us to practice properly, but he showed us how to do it. He didn't talk about it. He just said no. And he went back to the beginning. Bum, bum, bum. And then you get back to this <laughs> practicing, you did that because you remember his voice. So, and that's with everything. So thirds there, you know, you can do when you have to play that. But he started with don't number eight, this one. And he did this. I can't do it anymore, but that's good. That's also very good. Don't do too much because you you get tension here. You know, the two lines slowly. And if it goes out of tune, start at the beginning again. Don't go over the same place where it's out of tune. That's like having the same accident. <laughs> you know, you're driving the car, you had an accident. Now you guess what? Go right back to that same accident. Whoa, yo, yo. <laughs> so the mental attitude. And the other thing I think that's very important for younger people, the 50-minute hours. That's it. And then we used to usually take a 10-minute break. We'd go outside and smoke a cigarette or something like that. Uh, leave the instrument. Come back and do three hours. That's it. 50-minute hours, three hours, and then one in the evening sometime during the day let's say after school, or in that one hour, if you have a chance to play some chamber music, then play chamber music with somebody, with piano, with viola, with whatever it is. So you are then using the memory in a different way, automatically. We didn't think of that, you know? Nemochka, we never thought of these things when we were working with him. But my God, he made us do that without saying anything. He just did it. And then much later, when I went to a psychiatrist, <laughs> the psychiatrist said, you know what Freud said? The brain has a capacity of 40 to 45 minutes. That's it, in an hour. After that, <clears throat> you go crazy. You, you know, it, it doesn't function anymore. He did 50 minutes. Why? <coughs> it's very simple. Because most people, did you notice how they tune forever? 
<laughs> that 15 minutes is about 10 minutes of tuning. And you go, whoa, and he'd stop you. When you went to his lesson, you went to the room next door, he would watch you, he would listen to what was, he made you come 10 minutes before the lesson. That's when you said to me yesterday, will you be there five minutes before? <laughs> I started to laugh because that's what I do. I go to the rehearsal at least 10 minutes before. Not necessarily to warm up, to just get the mental attitude, the proper. It's so important, all this discipline aspects. So he watched you. And you know, you take out the violin case. Let's say you had a, I had a lesson 8 o'clock in the morning on Thursdays for two and a half years. So you start tuning. If you start tuning loud, you can't hear it. So he would, when you heard you do that, you come into the lesson, you say, why did you tune so loud? <laughs> I said, I don't know. He said, you play piano. <laughs> he took the violin, he went one way. One way, not. You see how many people do that? Unbelievable. An orchestra tunes more than they play. It's amazing and loud. So you can't hear anything. If you, even an orchestra, you know, you'll hear it. You know, when I played with Itzik for years, he goes, I always say, it's out of tune. He said, no, it's not. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, it's out of tune. He said, I tuned it already. I said, okay. So we play, you know, we don't tune. There's another reason why he said that. Not just because of time. Because when he had a lesson, you had that big hand would hit 12 o'clock. You were history. History, bye-bye. And he did that day, way, day in and day out for week after week after week. Christmas time, I think he took maybe two and a half weeks. And then before Meadow Man, he would do three weeks. And that's it. So imagine, he would start 7 o'clock in the morning. And Don Wallerstein was before me. Oh. So why did he do that? It's very interesting to think about later why he did that with the tuning. Because you have to try and play the strings that we had before the gut strings that went out of tune all the time, um, he would say, don't tune. In that 50 minutes, don't tune. Because when we arrived in things like, uh, we, would throw, you know, we would start fiddling around. But if you didn't practice that already, you couldn't do it. So you, you saw so many fiddle players before the dominance you know, before the cadenza, they would go. You know, they'd be tuning the whole time. Well, of course, because it, otherwise it was impossible to play it. So he would say, don't tune. It'll help. It doesn't mean it's a, a complete cure, but it helps. So the practicality of his approach, in my opinion, uh, is something I live with now for a very long, long time. Over 30 years now, showing practicality in concept, in concept, um, to, to students. It doesn't matter where they come from, because you don't have to say that much, especially if you have translators that don't know what the hell you're talking about in China or in Korea. Uh, they go, sounding point. You know, they say sounding point in their language, you know, and a kid looks at you and goes, what the hell is that? You know. So I say sounding point, very simple, look. One, two, sounding point, back, sounding point. Oh, <laughs> so that's it. And for that, we have martelets and we have all the changing of the strings and blah, blah, blah. Kreutzer number two is a miracle. Uh, number seven is even more of a miracle. Depends how you do it. And then it comes the cole and all these things that I think one needs to at least have an acquaintance with. Uh, because every single piece, doesn't matter where it is, where it's from, will have some of that grammar. I call it grammar. And the better you know how to use the grammar, the better pronunciation it'll be. But we work on concept. We ask people to write everything down. He made us write everything on the page. The best example I can show people is the beginning of the Rondo Capriccioso. The first two notes was 
put the bow on the string, half a bow. Again. Again. Of course, the minute there was harmony, <laughs> automatically, as human beings, we would go, no, he would say, no, no, no. In the lesson, you play like this. So, half a bow, division of the bow, division of bow, half a bow, you start, let's say, mezzo 40 ish Don't disappear, sounding point. Now comes the next note, same quality, prepare, travel, same. Again. Curl, save. Two, three, four, upside down. Play it like you are in a church. Don't start giving me this emotional stuff. That will come. There's no problem with that. Because we have a heart. We all have the heart. Ah, this is going to work first. Once you have that, this can automatically. And that piece, he worked on that for sometimes six months. The beginning. That's all he did. Six months. Again. You know, then there was the piano after a few weeks. And of course, the minute you hear that harmony, you go, oh, <laughs> you stop you immediately. And then came the other one. Then came the next episode. <laughs> now, as years went by, I have developed my own basic of practicing that. I also do the opposite. And when students say to me, why do you do it? I said, don't ask any questions. Just do it. <laughs> and about four weeks later, they go, I get it. It's so easy, you know? Okay, so these are very important aspects you know, that, that we learned from the old man with delay, with Sally Thomas, with March Pardee. It didn't matter who you were with because we were in the same basically in the same neighborhood. The application was a little different because we're different people. But I haven't developed anything new except some of the strokes just because I like metaphor in music, you know? Um, I really do. I, I, I use the metaphor for color, for phrasing. Of course, I learned so much from phrasing, from, from playing chamber music. Chamber music is essential. And he would let us play chamber music in the summertime with Mr. Gingold. Um, we would play all kinds of things, or sextets, octets, whatever. And so, and he would come and watch sometimes. He would go, you know, he'd look to see. And then he would say, I was watching. You know, you went, oh my God, what did I do? You know, he just all he said is, I was watching. That's it. You know, he was watching. That's it. So you don't do it again. And that's good. I think people need that when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, 20. Everything is going so fast. Slow it down. That's one of the ways to slow it down. And the language is very important in English. English. English is a very simple way of explaining things. For example, when you start at this, you get a catch. To the middle. wrong there nothing wrong with that now some people say to me but you know some people play this piece that come from that school sounds kind of boring I said well if it's boring to you then listen to somebody else <laughs> you know but there's nothing wrong in watching Michael Rabin play this stuff because that's perfect I mean perfect so does that mean that it's gonna move you does that mean it's gonna give you the example of all time for the rest of humanity of what this meant? No, of course not. 
but my God, it's wonderful. It's clean. Today, it's so dirty. I mean, people start, what are you doing? Take it easy. I, I show, for example, some of the students who start excerpts, I play this. Okay, it's called Bow Division. Now, after about three years, Mr. G gave us Sibelius concerto. Of course, we played the first movement, but then he started right away, this, uh, about two weeks in, last movement. And the last movement, he developed a way of, of playing that, which absolutely helps 99.9 .9 plus percent everything. And that goes like this. Catch, sustain. Stop. Catch, travel. Again. Catch. And what's wonderful is the music repeats. <laughs> so you don't have to say repeat. And once you know when you do this, even like that, it's in there. And it's much harder when you get here because the, the E string is thinner. So here, that's one pressure. Here's totally different. I spend a good month and a half on the first five lines. That's all I did when I played Sibelius. Because the first movement is not a problem, you know. Yeah, it's a problem, but it's not a problem, problem. This is to get you to play on a different level. So when you start to play it, circle. See, it looks easy, right? Yeah, of course it does, because the bow is functioning properly. That's it. No, but it takes time. It takes a long time, patience. He had the patience of an angel. Um, it was a miracle. And you know what happens? When they play Sibelius in the last round of these competitions, they always win if they come from this school. It's amazing, I promise you. Nine out of 10 Sibelius concerto in the last round, doesn't matter if it's Romania, Bulgaria, Chaco, I don't care. If you play Sibelius in the last round and they come from this method, they get first prize. That's it, because it's so clear. Bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, ba, bum. The orchestra knows exactly what to play. And everybody would say, why oh, it's so easy to play with this person. Yeah, it's also easy to listen to it, because <laughs> it sounds good. Um, and there are other things, of course, in that movement. For example, when he plays the five, you make a crescendo. Innuendo. He just made you do that. And so when you're playing it, it's just absolutely right there. So if you have to play the piece, for example, in somebody says, hey, two weeks from now, you got to play Sibelius Concerto because somebody canceled. Bingo. 24 hours, 48 hours, you're ready to play. Because it's so inside your system um, that it's much easier to prepare, to prepare. And that's really, I would say, just about everything, just about everything. When it's the in, intent of the content and the intent of the performer in the music that what we call grade A music, i.e. Beethoven, Schubert, Brahms, Bach, etc., cetera, um, that takes already a new facet. And sometimes we get lost. When we were working with him, we would get lost in the music because the music is so amazing uh, and because we wanted to make a good impression, even on the old man. And then he would say, very good, now start again. <laughs> and so we start again and he says, watch your bow. This is after two or three years of working, you know, so everything was already there. So when you go, Don't have 
to do all this nonsense. What the hell, you? It's amazing how many hours you can play. No? Some people say, well, you play a different boy sometimes? Of course. You know, because it's so in your system. It looks easy because it is. It's not hard if it works properly in graduation to what you want to express yourself. Now, of course, the meter is very important. The harmonic progressions are very important. All those up and down. And I make it simple in the lessons. I try, anyway. When you play a scale going up in Baroque music, make a crescendo. And when you're going down, make a diminuendo. No arguments. I don't want to hear anything else. Come on, do it. So they start. First of all, they play two notes. It's not two notes, it's one note. so difficult about that you know anyway look we can talk about this forever but one has to go to fundamentals one of the fundamental aspects and don't be ashamed to play fundamentals for yourself that's wonderful um, I played once long time I mean many times obviously over the years with Zubin Meta his Meili studied with Mr. Galamian when he first came to America in 55 I think it was or 50 I don't remember 57 he went to Curtis. He became second violin in the Curtis Quartet. And he took some lessons because Meili was very interested in what Galamian, Galamian method was. And so one day I was playing just because we were sharing a room. And I went. <laughs> he stopped me. He said, Pinkala, I heard that so, so many years from my father. I said, yeah. <laughs> was it good? He said, it was good. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny how it sticks with you. Um, it's not a very complicated set of circumstances to be able to do that. You don't have to be the genius of all time. It doesn't. And that's it. And when, you, when we get older, we try to find shortcuts. That can be a problem. So you need a good pair of ears that are with you most of the time. Sometimes it's a pianist. Sometimes it's a, another violinist. Or you're playing quartets. And to say, hey, what, what, what's that? And you go, sorry, I didn't mean that, you know? So these are lucky things for me personally. I met some extraordinary mentors that really dug into me big time, big time. I mean, I spent about three and a half, almost four days on the first four lines of the Beethoven Concerto with Isaac Stern. Hoi, yoi, 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 yoi. I mean, I still have a problem playing the beginning. Better than it was because I found my own way of doing things now through the teaching. For example, I do octaves, but the, the next octave, the left hand moves as fast as when you're playing it. But concentrate on the bottom note. And it, what's amazing is it builds also a muscular dexterity for one and four. Much easier. And it comes from the Beethoven Concerto. He didn't show me that, Stern. He showed me what the harmony had. And he said, you're a little late when you're changing position. Well, I went... You know, so. 
but two notes help because you're not practicing it. It's absolutely amazing. But where he didn't know is when I did like this. So Isaac said, what are you doing? I said, I'm staying at the sounding point. Then, in. It's a wonderful exercise. And when you have this. exercises in the world. People say, where's the music? I said, it's there. <laughs> Don't worry about the music. Play me in tune and then we'll go up and down every four bars. That's all. You know, it takes time. But that's a concept. It, it's not easy. It's The concept is sometimes very bothersome to a lot of people. Hey, I'm sorry if it is. It's not for me. So, and I stick with it until I can see that the person that's doing it understands it. In other words, it's really internalized. You know, I played Tchaikovsky concerto with the old man for about six months. And when I finished the whole three movements, I was playing something different. He also said to me, next week I want to hear Tchaikovsky. I said, but Mr. G, I just played Tchaikovsky. I want to hear the page before cadenza. I said, what? He said, this one. That's after six months I played that piece. He made me play that for months after that. One page I said, next week, Tchaikovsky. You know, that's what I do. I teach exactly like that. Because that page will help just about everything we do. You don't know it at the time, but my God, when you have things like... Um, the mechanics in one side and the emotion on the other side and guess what they actually like each other sometimes they meet <laughs> you know and when they meet and it feels right oh it's the greatest feeling in the world but it takes I don't know how many performances who knows and if you can remember two out of I don't know how many hundreds then you've done something good for music that's it and I don't argue or talk about it a lot. I just do it. I just do it with the kids. I do it whenever. I do it with the orchestras a lot. Not like this. But when, when I see people going, I say, what, what can I put you on the string? On the string. Whoa, it's amazing what happens. Especially in the cellos and basses. From the string. And they go, ooh. We never made such a sound. Well, of course not. <laughs> you know, especially in slow movements sometimes, you see the bow going, whew, 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 and you go, what are you doing? You know? And that's called bow division. It's not difficult if you know it. It's difficult if you don't know it, of course. So, uh... I have pencil diminuendo. Otherwise, I don't want to hear that. 
So over the years, I've put markings in my parts, which are hundreds of pieces, certain things. And somebody eventually will say, Pinky, do you really mean a diminuendo? I said, no, I don't want an accent. That's all. They go, oh, okay. They get it. So why? Because they didn't go through the same, necessarily the same thing. doesn't mean that if you've done it in a section, it's going to sound great. No. You still have to practice it to make it even, to, you know, all kinds of things. So, look, I, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not inventing the wheel. I have never tried to do that. I try, as you heard from the other girl, when I see somebody playing with such a beautiful sonority, I ask them to, give, to tell me a story. Sing it. Tell me the story. Listen to Milstein. I listen to the great masters, you know, because they could do things. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with imitation because it will never be imitated. Your DNA is totally different. But there's a little bit of remembering what it's like. And yes, I heard Yasha when he, he and Carnegie Hall. And you know what? I wanted to play like Yasha. Still do. Ten minutes. Just once. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ah, can't do it. So comes the chorus of Sonata. It was horrible. And he, but he got to this. It was that almost the tempo. And the last time, and he put the bow down. And you heard 250 violins going, oh. <laughs> So what did we do? We left the concert hall. We went right home, tried to do it. Nah, of course it doesn't work. So was it right? Who cares? It's such a symbol for this incredible finesse that he had, that he developed. He developed. He wanted to play like Chrysler, but he couldn't. So he then began what we know today as J.H. And it's pretty, pretty amazing when you hear that in the hall, the sound was silk, like silk. There was not one note out of place. And he worked very hard for that every year, for many years. And when it finally was beginning to dwindle, he stopped because he himself was unhappy with what he was doing. And that takes tremendous knowledge and courage. So you can apply that, I think, much earlier on when something is not quite right when you're practicing, when you're working, or when you plus played something, leave it alone. Come back to it a little later. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's two months. Get back, get, leave it. Don't get yourself into a fix. That's easy said. <laughs> you know, because eh, sometimes, all of a sudden, something goes bakakt. And you go, what the hell is that? But you know what he used to do, J.H.? he go right backstage and he start practicing. Because I asked him once. I said, how do you do that? How do you play a passage if it didn't go well inside your brain? Now, we didn't hear it. But you felt funny. He said, I go back to the hotel. I play scales and I play slow. Which I never saw it before. That's it. And you go, my God, that talk about discipline. Now, how many people do that? Not too many, unfortunately. So the only thing I'll say now and I'll stop is one great conductor, musician, philosopher, Cello Badake. Sergio Cello Badake was Romanian, phenomenal. Um, one day we had a long lunch. Anyway, he said to me, remember that mediocrity is poison. Stay away from it. Really good. Thank you. Thank you, Pinkos. Uh, it's such a joy to hear you tell everything. You just, you know, you know, we could spend an hour, an, another hour just listening to your stories because you, you answer so many questions which everyone has in mind. And I think it's really important what you say. It's important that so many people uh, are able to join us today and they're still with us. There are over 100 people still watching this webinar. And I'm sure everyone had an uh, incredible time because with your experience, with your, with your career of de developing your ideas and playing this incredible repertoire for so many years and working with incredible musicians, I think you, you, it's just amazing that you're able to articulate everything and to share it with us. 
And I uh, really, really thank you deeply for- well, I, You know, I, Dima, I, I really, really, I know I'd love to answer everybody that have questions, but it's not the answers. It's what you hear that you can improve on. And that comes learning really from the masters that can teach. I, I mean, if it doesn't work right, you have to change the master, that's all. Uh, you mentioned I, something yesterday when we talk, I just want you to repeat Remember the, the story you said uh, that Isaac Stern told you once? That you should be as a... Sponge. Yeah. That's in, what that you, sponge. You, learn, you learn from ev everyone. You learn from all the experiences. You learn... Uh, I'm telling you about Reusman, uh, Opus 18, number four. I'll show you. Sasha <laughs> you know but that beginning was magic magic the those was the fingerings you were mentioning that the, you also Dumbo oh, I never forget and also this one he played open string and I also only learned years later from Milstein. Why, I asked him, I said, why do you play so many open strings and flageolets? He said, because violin play alone. And you think, my God, of course, violin plays alone. And this, but what I learned from him, when he shift, He played a harmonic, what we call harmonic. Now we don't play like that, but, but he did. I spent once 15, almost 20 minutes. Again, you know, 15 minutes back and forth, back and forth. Finally, I said, You know, Nathan, you know my name? <laughs> he went, Suk. Oh, Suk. <laughs> okay, I get it. He said, Fine, fine, fine. Go ahead, do it. I <laughs> remember that that was from the documentary. Yeah. You were, you were, yeah. Well, 15 minutes. It was just, just that one. That's it. Did you make you think also how it's important an individual to try different fingerings, different voice, just to find something? For your own sure, artistic sure. Ar artistic vision that, that it's very really individual right not at the start not when you're teaching the teaching they have to get the same fingering same boings that we have for many years unfortunately with patty she has now over 30 years she sometimes has certainly two different possibilities on one thing you know one phrase and sometimes three and i said where'd you get that she said from you i said for me <laughs> said, yeah, you came in you changed your mind so you did that thing i said no i did not she said you don't remember because she writes everything down because that's what she was told to do write it down and she said for seven years with miss delay you know seven years next to her uh, and she became her assistant uh at juilliard so did she learn something you bet she did so, and I never worked with Miss Delay, but I, I can understand where it's coming from, obviously. Uh, she was a remarkably patient woman uh, with tremendous love for the person that was playing, not just the instrument, the playing. I went once to see her in her house. I used to live not far from her in Rockville. And um, it, was, um, it was a wonderful afternoon. We never talked about the violin, nothing. And I, once in a while, I said, do you want to talk about something in the Philly? She said, no, you know what to do. Yeah, you don't have to talk to me. 
I said, okay. Uh, it was sweet. It was very, very sweet. I didn't practice. I didn't work with her. So, But you can see a lot of the people that worked with her in, his, in her prime um, were really pretty amazing fiddle players. Uh, and they could do many things on the instrument that very few people can, you know. Um, and that's great. That That is, she left a legacy that uh, I, I think very few people have done that in their lifetime. Viotan, maybe. Isai, maybe. Uh, Gingold, somewhat, you know, Galamin, of course. But he left it with people. He didn't leave it as just a book. Um, there's a wonderful, oh, I, you have two minutes? I was, uh, Charlie Afsharian was trying to get some of the VHS of Mr. G teaching. And I happened to be at the Watergate. And in those days, we had a VHA machine. So he sent me a bunch of tapes. So I put one in, and it's at, it's at Meadowman. I won't define how it is. A, a girl playing some exercise, and she didn't do what it says in the page. And she, he was talking to her in French, and uh, which was unusual, because she really did not speak English. She was just there for the summer. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, she really was like a, like a table, you know? So he finally stood up, he went over to the stand, and he went on the other side, and he took the page, and the page went right back. <laughs> <laughs> and he started to laugh. Uh, his laugh was, <laughs> were you really laughing? And the page went, and he said to her in French, you did not practice. She said, oh, no, no, I just wish, just wish, practice. And so he did, he took the page, and it went, uh, <laughs> and I was alone in the room. I think I must have been laughing for half an hour. I was crying. I looked it over and over. What a genius, that guy. So he said, she obviously never opened the page, the, the, the page, you know. <laughs> so how can you learn to do it if you don't look at what it's written? Stupid. So it teaches you a lot because when kid, kids come in and say, uh, hey, have you looked at the music? Oh, yeah. So I go over and I, I just to make sure that it's, <laughs> it's very funny. But that was Mr. G. Oh, my God. He was a genius. And, but he was tough, you know. He was also very tough. Uh, he, when I, when I, he didn't give many compliments. Uh, when I played Tchaikovsky piano finally in Meadowmount after months and months of learning it, he came to the room. I was putting it away, and he looked at me and he said, Thank you. One day you will play this piece very well. <laughs> I was like, you know, the compliment of all times. And um, I understood what he meant. At that point, I was already with him for almost three years. So you learn what to do and you learn what not to do. And that's really important. And that's it. Uh, because th those aspects of playing properly, meaning sound-wise, phrasing-wise, you don't ever take it for granted. Never, ever take it for granted. And if you take it for granted, one day, you'll get into a habit, it'll become two days. And before you know it, it's two months. Mm, not good. That's not good. So, you know, just go back to the fundamentals as much as you can. Not a lot, you know. I do this for about 25 minutes, half hour every morning. Really, every morning. And I do some Beethoven, I do some Brahms. I mean, I have to play a whole bunch of pieces, so I'm not just doing that. But you know, A major concerto, Mozart, I'll go. <laughs> just to remind the stupid brain that that's what you have to do. The hand has to go there first, otherwise, <laughs> you know, so. That's all. And this one. Last two times, I played this and I went bacocked. So now I go organize it, organize it. So I have to take, I have to delete that mistake. I'm a human, you know, I, what can I do? And then, you know, m musicians in the orchestra, they come to me and say, Pinky, you're finally one of us. <laughs> I said, yeah, you stupid. Compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, things happen. They do happen. What are you going to do? 
there is, you know, there's not much we can do about it. But we try to get it to the same level as much as you can in here, you know, somewhere. And the hands, the hands, uh, they're not getting younger. You know? Is there something you, you have, uh, you can share, you do mentally to prepare before the concert? Do you have some kind of routine? You mentioned about practicing scales, playing Bach, and you mentioned yesterday beautifully that you go usually before the concert in advance and sometimes before, before rehearsal you listen to the orchestra to get yourself in a, in a mood. Well, yeah, the concerts, I, I have a, let's call it a superstition. Uh, you know, many people have different superstitions. Um, I usually, if it's a concert at 8 o'clock, let's say, in the evening, doesn't matter where, by around 6 or so, I have a cup of coffee, um, and I go in the shower. And I, I loosen, my, I run in the shower. Not run, but I, I do, you know, anyway, to loosen my shoulders. Uh, by quarter to 7, sometimes I get dressed because it's such a pain in the neck to carry too much stuff. I used to just take my suit with me. No, I sometimes get dressed. And I get to the to the place. Um, I take it out, uh, and I tune. I play a few scales. Uh, I try not to spend too much time backstage, depending what the orchestra is playing. Um, if I'm playing first, let's say a concert in the first half, I'm there a good half an hour, twenty minutes to half an hour before. But I have already played a rehearsal that morning. That's the last rehearsal day. The next day. I will do something during the day, and then again the same thing. Six o'clock, bingo. Sometimes a little earlier, depends on the weather. But I don't go into hysterionics, and that's because I think I'm prepared well enough to feel comfortable, meaning comfortable, to feel the essence of what I need to do for myself first in the music. And then I, I go on stage and I have certain elements that I do in certain pieces, like tutis, I will play with the orchestra, especially when I'm conducting. I, I'm already turned around to the orchestra, I will play some of the tutti. Um, not a lot, because when you're playing Beethoven concerto, you have about almost three and a half minutes before you play. Uh, hands get a little cold, dry. Uh, so I will usually play the second violin part here. because I like that B-flat. <laughs> B-flat and D major, it's amazing. And then I give it up and then let it be. And that comes from Isaac. And then, he did three of those. I do three of those. Now, funny story, true story. Unfortunately, he died. I was playing the concerto maybe a month or so later, and I don't remember where. And I said to myself, Pink, he's not coming to the concert. <laughs> you know, maybe he'll hear it up there, but it'll be so far away. So I decided I won't do any of that. Nothing, you know? I'll just stand there and I'll, I'll do this and let it be, but not play. That's it. And you know what? It's exactly the same. It didn't make any difference. So I thought to myself, you stupid, you know? Years and years and years. Okay, so the next night, I'm playing the ne next night, same place, same orchestra. You know what? I went right back to the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so is that a superstition? Absolutely. Does it help? I don't know. Probably <laughs> not. But so what? It somehow settles you a little bit. I listen a lot to what's happening, especially when I'm conducting. That's the, that, that tutti goes by much faster because you're thinking as a conductor and it goes, you have to think ahead and a little bit easier because sometimes when I'm playing with certain people that I love, I am enamored, you know, at what they're doing to the orchestra. I just stand and go, my God, one day I'm going to do that, you know. So, or I get somebody, uh, people that, and uh, I go, oh my God. So I just turn to the orchestra here. Sometimes I go over there and I get these looks like, hmm. So 
anyway so it's but that's so many years so 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 many years of doing so many things in so many places not least of all in the asian countries where when i first started to go it was a very foreign place you know very foreign and so um you learn from all these experiences because my middle name is curious and uh, and that's why I never went to school because there's no curiosity in the school you know that textbook is blech. so but I learned everything in the street really and many streets and why not um, so is it good is it bad I tell the kids you better do that homework but I didn't do the homework you know because I kind of knew a little bit of what was going on so I decided the hell with it. But that's wrong. That was definitely wrong. But hey, I was alone. I was in New York. But I had a fantastic foundation when I first from Israel. Um, with private tutoring, with uh, solfege, with harmony, 10, 11, two years. I had a great teacher called Boscovich. So I, I was prepared for this already. Um, so when I went to theory class at Juilliard, I fell asleep most of the time. <laughs> Except for Hall Overton. Paul Overton was a jazz player. He taught us, he used to start with the Paul Mall. In those days, we would smoke in class in the old school, and he would start jazzing up Bach, all kinds of Bach inventions. He would just jazz it up, and I went, oh my God, that's good. And that was interesting, but that wasn't part of the curriculum, you know. So, but anyhow, the point is that you don't lose a lot of what you know and learn when you are first. There, I mean, I remember Fahir. We played chamber music almost twice a week. When, since I was about nine years old, nine, 10, 11, 12, four years, I played just about everything, except for the Bartok quartets, which you can't read. That's, you gotta know that. I played everything. So, first violin, second violin, first violin, second, and she played with us. She had a beautiful sound. She was very natural playing, beautiful player. She was a big, huge star already before the first, second war. I have her program from 1936 in Budapest. Somebody gave it to me. Amazing. So, but she wasn't known. She was Jewish, and she had to fight all the anti-Semitism at that time. Imagine, in the 30s. So, but she was a great fiddle player. And uh, like, like Erika Marini, uh, those people, they still talk about her. When I go back to Budapest, the older guys, they say, oh, fed hell, Ilona. Oh. They always go, oh. <laughs> which is nice, and she taught us to play with a beautiful sound. You had to play with a beautiful sound. And if you didn't play with a beautiful sound, she got really angry. But she gave us a very good basic routine. The only thing I learned when I came to America, from the beginning, literally open string. I mean, we always, um, I learned the mechanics of how to make a beautiful sound explaining it in detail, language detail. And that is lucky, because I had both worlds. And hopefully I'm still putting it together most of the time. Absolutely. <laughs> Only thing I can tell you I share with the, with the younger people is when you're playing as you get older and you are successful and you're doing well, you will begin to hear only wrong things when you're playing. You won't be hearing good things. And that's maybe not a bad thing. I hear now so much crap that's coming out of my playing and people go what are you talking about it was fabulous and, eh. so I don't know what it is that and I've talked to a lot of people about that you play so much you play so many years and you begin to hear basically not nothing that's really that good but if you have a good pair, pair of ears around you I have one called Amanda the minute I play one note she goes hey she comes in the room she says that's out of tune I said sorry I, I, I know I know like I was playing with Viola Bartok the other day and there's one harmonic, uh, E and G, up, I never quite make it up there. So she comes in, she says, what's the matter with you? You can't get up there? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm trying, you know. So, and I had Mike Nykrook for 31 years. Um, and so we, we were a good team uh, for a long time. And that was lucky. Again, very, very lucky. It stays with you. That stays with you. It never goes away. So I just share it with as much as I can, with as many people as I can. And the only thing I don't know how to tell somebody, I can explain it, like today with the Vinyavsky, um, but then it has to come from the person. 
and she was beginning to do that. And what happens in a class, I don't do too much of it anymore. I play sometimes, just a little sample, you know. And they'll stand there and go, oh, I can't do that. I said, yes, you can. So they start to imitate a little bit. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, because I did the same thing. I'm still doing it, you know, with certain fiddle players. I'll imitate how they played. Uh, what the hell is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it, because it's your DNA. You know, nobody's going to know I'm imitating Francis Gatti for that one bar. Are you kidding? <laughs> no. So I wish I could, but I can't. So, But it's stuck in the ear, right? So, But I don't play like that. That's not my concept. People misunderstand that a lot. Um, so, you know, when we worked with Isaac, for example, on the Concertante in 1972, when I first played with him, three days with Daniel at the piano in London. Three days. And I said to him, you know what? I don't know what Boeing to play anymore. He said, good. <laughs> so I said, but that's not, I, what am I going to do? He said, you'll figure it out. Comes the orchestra. We had two rehearsals. We had to play outside, you know, and outdoor. You know, we started to play, and I started playing slightly different Boeings that he did. And he came up to me and says, that's not the Boeing we talked about. I said, I know, but I don't like it. He says, do it. So in the next concert, I tried to do as much as we did together. And he looked at me and said, you know what? You're a different person than I am. Go ahead, do what you want. <laughs> so all that time, you know, all this talking. And then over the years, I developed my own, I hate the word style, but, you know, things like... I think... Can you hear it? That was him. But I don't play like that. And most of the time people say, where'd you get that boy? I said, from Michael Tree. <laughs> <laughs> and on the viola, oh, it's great. It's perfect. On the viola, it's even better. So, and I don't start up all. Why do I cross that? Because the the phrase grows in dynamic and in color. So you cross, not the first time though. But you gotta be able to do that. That comes from Galamian. Ah, there you go. So you mix it up. And it goes on and on and on and on. Anyhow, pleasure. Dimitska, whenever you want, whatever you want, however you want it, let me know. And if it's possible, I'm more than happy to. And certainly when we get more normal, if I'm around, you know, by all means, don't hesitate. Give me a buzz. Thanks so much. I deeply appreciate it. And for I mean, I seriously, I mean, because the only thing that I know for sure that is people that are about 16 to about 24 are going through such hormonal changes. It is so complicated. I've worked on that a little bit in my own head. They need to feel good. And if you can make them feel good for even 20 minutes in, in one day, you've accomplished a lot. And that's all I try to do is to make them feel better about what they're doing. And you know what happens? They start doing the same thing in their own teaching. You know, most of the people will say, ah, I'm not going to teach. No, but eight years, 10 years later, hey, you know, I have a position in Wiesbaden and I have five students. I said, bravo. <laughs> it's not doing it because they have to earn a living all of a sudden. They're doing it because they had a need to explain what the hell they heard. And sometimes it works and some, and they say, what do you do when this happens? I said, so we start talking about the students. It's good. I think it's healthy. Okay. Listen, you make us feel good for almost three hours. So I deeply right. thank you again. <laughs> all right, good luck to everybody. Thanks so much. Yeah, all, stay safe. Yeah, stay well. Thank you, Yeah. Stay safe. For everyone who joined us today, I'm sure you had uh, unforgettable time and it was really remarkable to have such a wonderful artist to share so many so many very personal thoughts and uh, experience through his life i'm sure it will take the time for us to comprehend everything you heard today but uh, again i deeply appreciate this opportunity and uh, 
I look forward congratulations, to Dima, for doing this, you know, for all of us. It's wonderful that you had this idea. You had to have some symbol. Obviously, Miss Delay is a pretty good symbol. So uh, I, I, I congratulate you for doing that. That takes you. conviction, and that's great. Thank you, everyone. So please join us uh, next week. We'll have another uh, webinar, and hopefully we'll have many, many more. Again, I would like to thank uh, Laurie Harris, who has uh, established special funding for support in, in this uh, Doris Dillon Masterclass series. And I thank everyone who pays interest and comes for this kind of webinars. I think it's important for everyone. So I look forward to welcoming all of you in the future. Thank you again for joining and all the best. Bye-bye.